Um, so I've been reading a book called Evolutionaries by Carter Phipps. And um, in the book, there's this uh, topic that's brought up a lot. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject. Uh, but it's basically the idea that societies develop over time. They develop. They progress. They get better. Um, and it's equated with evolution. So we have this sense of progress and development, and it's put right next to evolution. You know, they're used almost synonymously uh, sometimes. Um, and within even, like, uh, you know, I went to a lecture by Carter Phipps, uh, Elizabeth DeBold, and... Uh, Steve McIntosh, and they're all kind of authors in this integral evolution of consciousness, a uh, particular worldview. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess they're, they're kind of popular now because um, they're, they're all writing books. Uh, I, I don't know if Elizabeth is writing books, but Phipps has just come out with this one. Andrew Cohen earlier in uh, the fall came out with his book called Evolutionary Enlightenment. Um, Steve McIntosh is just is coming out with his book, this summer called Evolution's Purpose. So um, I don't know if it's popular or they're just trying a new, uh, you know, way to, to publish their media. Um, but, uh, you know, a large part of their worldview and a lot of people who follow them is this idea that societies get better over time, that societies develop over time. And I, I don't know if this is a good thing to equate with evolution. And I think if we really want to understand what evolution means in a social and cultural context, I, I really feel that, you know, simplifying, generalizing um, terms like development, developmental spectrum and stages and uh, uh, is way too simplistic uh, to, to say that, you know, um, for instance, my, my girlfriend's home country of Egypt is on a lower developmental stage than the United States. Because I think that's, uh, well, you know, it almost seems ridiculous to even state that, but the general argument is that, you know, we have individual freedoms, we're no longer a religious society, um, you know, we're no longer a traditional society, at least, we're a secular state, um, and so on. So, like, there's that, there's that whole philosophy that, you know, we even progressed out of the medieval ages and into the new scientific age and the renaissance and that sort of thing. So they see that as a development as well, as a kind of movement upwards. Um, and it, I've wrestled with this idea because on one hand, I do think that there is a growth process happening through evolution. Um, it just, to me, I don't know, maybe you get the same sort of funny feeling, but to see something in, in these nice, neat, all-encompassing, monological stages of consciousness uh, seems way too simplistic for uh, for actual reality. And that almost seems like a given, you know. Um, maybe you don't really think that just, you know, stating that is obvious, you know. Uh, but, you know, you have a whole a subculture of people. I think maybe they tend to be Westerners, um, you know. I, that, that, uh, basically believes that they're on the leading edge of, of, of human culture. And and by that I mean literally, like they're Andrew Cohen himself has said, you know, we're my teachings are only for, you know, a specific group of people and that's okay and everybody develops and that sort of thing. There's a kind of like implicit bias or hubris in this. Um that I don't know if they can help or not. I don't necessarily I'm not trying to tear them down. I appreciate some of their inspired work and and I myself am very much enthralled by evolution, um, but there's there's this other um, intrinsic bias, maybe, or, or attitude that just doesn't sit right with me. Um, and I'm not against development. I'm not against growth. It just yeah, I'm trying to take this out of the realm of just like abstract ideas. You know, that's where I tend to work, but. Um, it's this whole idea that, you know, we can understand evolution as a series of neat, linear developmental stages. And the philosopher Ken Wilber, who really influenced this community, basically he's kind of like the spawn of this community. Um, but he didn't start these ideas. He, he didn't start the evolution of consciousness as an idea that's much, much older. Um, and he gives them credit to his credit. And so does so did the evolutionaries. I mean, this book, 
talks about all of them. You know, Tehar de Chardin, John Gebser, Sri Aurobindo, Owen Barfield, Rudolf Steiner, those people. Like, these guys all talked about that. Um, but if you notice, a lot of them were spiritual, first and foremost. Um, and then there are other social theorists, like Marshall McLuhan, who has you know, a conception of this all through media studies and the evolution of language and communications. All of this stuff is so fascinating, and you can make a video about it all by themselves, each one. Um, but the problem I think I have with um, sticking to it's a de this developmental spectrum is that you lose the nuances. You lose the, um, the intricacy of the reality of everyday people, and also the big ideas themselves. Um, and what I see happening with folks like Carter Phipps and even Ken Wilber is a kind of romanticism of uh, modernism. And I, this, this suspicion was confirmed in the conversation um, that I had with uh, Steve McIntosh when he visited New York City and uh, later during his talk um, where him, uh, Elizabeth DeBold, and Carter Phipps all had a presentation about cultural evolution. Um, they, he met, uh, Steve directly stated that integral theory, evolutionary theory, is a, is modernism in what he calls a higher harmonic. So he's, he's admitting, he's acknowledging that in some sense, this particular evolutionary worldview, which I think I should probably emphasize, it's just one, um, uh, sees things as as a developmental a uh, b a progressive um, and c you know uh, highly structured highly uh, even in a some sense generalized and smooth upward momentum and Ken Wilber has this term called transcendent include it's a kind of catchphrase for everything um, and it means generally as you grow then you transcend your previous level and you move to the next level and then you move to the next level. It's like a video game. Um, and, you know, like, at a gut level, I go, that's not the way life is. That's not the way my life is. I wish it was that easy, you know. <laughs> at stage 10, uh, stage 11, I mean, I need to get to level 99, you know, like World of Warcraft or something, uh, level 85. Um, and, I, you know, I know they're not meant, I'm not trying to create the straw man arguments. I know they have had sophisticated philosophies behind it. But I think as sophisticated and complex as you make the theory, the fact that you're using these developmental structures or stages to try to describe human society seems just off. It just doesn't seem quite right. And I think the main reason um, that I have a problem with it is because I don't see human societies as following these strict stages of development. I think um, to some degree you can use these categories and terms to generally describe some things. But A, not developmentally. And B, definitely not progressively. Um, Jean Gebser himself, you know, one of these theorists, these founding theorists in the 50s who wrote Ever-Present Origin, said that, you know, the evolution of consciousness is not developmental, it's not progressive, because progress is progress away from what he called the origin, which is very similar to Hegel's understanding of the spirit or the geist behind life. Um, and maybe I should pause and go to that for just a second, but Hegel... Um, believe that there was a dialectical process of history in which spirit through the relationship and play of opposites and unifying those opposites was revealing itself, was fulfilling itself, was discovering itself. A kind of, um, and I don't know if he was influenced by Eastern philosophy, but it's a kind of historicizing of the play of Leela, the divine play of, um, you know, the ultimate divine consciousness uh, forgetting itself and then rediscovering itself. So he develops this whole dialectic of history where that's happening. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's kind of this dialectic um, of opposites. And even that, you know, that's just one way of seeing, you know, this sort of thing. Um, but to jump back, uh, folks like uh, Steve McIntosh, Carter Phipps are taking all those ideas. They're trying to resurrect and revive them. They're trying to set them in the context of today. And they develop these theories. Um, like, for instance, uh, spiral dynamics is a theory of this, like, you know, developmental stages where there, there's earlier human societies and there's later ones. And everybody's on this spectrum moving up. Um, so 
I really don't know at the, at the time being if I can actually describe this in a way that's not abstract. So I'm just going to abstract, and I'm sorry if this is kind of, like too out there. Um, but my problem with this is generally it does not allow for breakdown. It does not allow for the messiness of, of, of consciousness, of movement, of societies, of... You know, one culture having this great developed thing and another culture not having that at all, but they have something totally different that's really great too. Um, so for me, seeing the evolution of consciousness is more of a symbiosis. There, there could be movement. There could be emergence. But it's not happening in this kind of easy, transcendent, include way. It's not at all. I mean, um, even for like, you know, single cells become multicellular organisms or... or um, for the first cells themselves to have multiple organisms in them, it was a chaotic process of symbiosis where one guy was trying to eat another guy and it failed. And all of a sudden, the bigger guy started to incorporate these little invading parasitic cells that become, uh, you know, um, symbiotic and independent. They, they give, like the mitochondria in our, in our cells gives us our energy and they have their own DNA. They, they come... So I think... There's something to be said, not necessarily from seeing things purely in a developmental and vertical spectrum, which is something that you so often, but seeing it in a relating way. Like, how we come together creates an emergence in and of itself. How you and, you and I, in this exchange, whoever you are, um, wherever you are, there, there's a, a relationship. There's an emergent relationship that's more than the sum of our parts. You know, more than the two of us coming together, there's this dynamic emergence between our interaction, between friendship, between just taking a walk. There's a there's a beautiful emergence that happens with you whenever you're encountering. Um, so, you know, just as a footnote, I would just say, as far as development is concerned, development happens through, emergence happens, I think I would rather use emergence, through relationship, through the horizontal interacting of life, of people, of, of cultures. So here we are at a planetary level, at a world scale. Um, sorry, I used level, but um, I guess I'm using it more generally. You know, I, I don't have categorical levels that I use in my you know philosophy or framework. Uh, here we are at a world scale, planetary scale. We're all trying to get along. We have traditional cultures. We have these cultures. We have shamanic cultures and indigenous societies. We have, you know, geek culture. We we have, you know, all these different religions. And really to say that they all try to fit into this developmental spectrum to me makes very little sense. Rather, I would, I would rather say we're all kind of organelles in a cell and we're all trying to learn how to work together. And it's not going to happen by everybody following what the West did. You know, like, uh, the older stages or structures or whatever you want to call it could have something just as important that the new structures are missing. And I think that's the point, actually, in evolution. Um, to use Lynn Margulis, who, who uh, he uses in one of his chapters, actually, for, this, for opposite reasons, to kind of say symbiosis is nice, but development's more important, or we need to get back to it. Really, that's the whole idea. We need to get back to it. And really, that's like the... Let me pause and just say that I think that's what it comes down to as far as these thinkers. Um, it's basically calling for modernism, like a neo-modernism. Postmodernism and relativity and all these new discoveries, they're all important, but let's get back to the big picture, which is about development, which is about vertical growth, and that sort of thing. I'm arguing, yes, let's get back to them, but let's not get romantic about it and try to re resurrect modernism with a higher harmonic. Let's really try to discover how, through the insights of modern science and biology, um, through the insights of postmodern philosophy, and also through an understanding, through those insights, that older societies has, has, has stuff that we don't. Um, how can we then incorporate all of this and create a world culture? That's what it comes down to for me. And I don't see that necessarily happening through this weird dialectic where there are stages of development. Um, it's just not, it seems too unrealistic and too simplistic to really encompass what's going on in human society, let alone a single cell. Um, so that's my criticism. That's my main criticism of this evolutionary developmental worldview. And it doesn't discount emergence. It doesn't discount growth. It just wants to understand growth in a healthier, more holistic way. That 
can let you speak for yourself instead of being fit into a stage or a structure. Um, and the perfect example I have is actually Charles Eisenstein, who's a good who's a good thinker in this regard. And he basically puts this uh, idea forward where um, we have all these different cultures in the world, and they all have like one important piece, like this society, this society, this society, this society. They all have these unique gifts they've been given that they they've each developed, and they really need to come together as a whole, almost like a cell has to come together with all these different organelles, all these different parts. Um, and yeah, if you compare the nucleus maybe to the flagellum, the flagellate uh, organisms, you'd say, wow, this nucleus is far more developed. This nucleus has all these qualities, and this little flagellum has to get involved with this sort of thing over here. It needs to develop. Rather than see that, how about let's just put them together, and then we have movement, and then the cell can move. So that's how I see societies um, and cultures. They're symbiotic. And through the symbiosis comes emergence. Um, so, taking the example, indigenous societies and their sense of shamanism, spirituality, healing, um, the holistic, all-embodied sense, and modern societies, which tend to be alienated from their bodies, um, very little, uh, a very poor understanding or appreciation of spirituality, um, a kind of alienation from the world and from spirit, um, but extremely sophisticated sciences um, and, and technological powers and, you know, you know, longer life expectancy and so on. Um, these aren't a developmental spectrum. They're, they're almost like different social organisms, different ways of life <clears throat> that are not meant one to incorporate and completely consume the other. Because I think that's basically what... Um, is implied in a, in a weaker sense, maybe than in, you know, at the turn of the last century, with like positivists who say, you know, we all need to become rational beings, that's the next step. Um, in a weaker sense than that, but they're still implying this worldview where you, you really have to give up uh, where you are and incorporate something else, uh, this other thing. Rather than that, I think, rather than giving up who we are as in, in traditional societies and ancient societies and modern scientific societies, Rather than giving that up, we have to realize we have to work together. We've kind of been thrust upon each other, and we need to learn how to organize and, and come together. So that's really my main criticism of the evolutionaries and their developmental spectrum of history. Um, so if you liked it, uh, comment or make a response video. I'm sorry that it was long. I'm trying to shorten my videos I'm down from 30 minutes to about 20. So uh, thanks for listening, guys, and uh, have a great night.